With no other introductions, it's now time for question period. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker, and good morning. I'm glad to see you made it okay. My uh, question is to the Minister of Energy. After the Auditor General raised concerns about the government's hydro scheme, which will end up costing billions and then jack up electricity rates to record highs in a few years, the Minister of Energy said, quote, our plan has been approved by her peers, speaking of the Auditor General, at some of Canada's top accounting firms like KPMG, Ernst & Young and Deloitte. The Auditor General has said, as of March 19th, that, quote, Deloitte LLP and Ernst & Young LLP have confirmed to us that they provided no formal opinions, oh. no formal opinions approving the accounting of the so-called Fair Hydro Plan oh, that the government planned to use for its consolidated financial statements, end quote. So, Mr. Speaker, who's telling the truth here? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As we've said all along, we know, Mr. Speaker, that families in this province asked for real and immediate relief on their electricity bills, and that's what we delivered, Mr. Speaker. We made a policy choice. The member will withdraw. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we made a policy choice to ensure that we continue to have a clean, reliable, and affordable electricity system for the ratepayers of today and the ratepayers of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. And the Fair Hydro Plan keeps the cost of borrowing within the rate base, not the tax base, because that's the logical thing to do, Mr. Speaker. Electricity financing should remain with the electricity system. So officials from the Treasury Board, Finance, OPG, the ISO, and the Ontario Financing Authority, along with external advisors, that included Ernst & Young, KPNG, and Deloitte, have Answer. worked on accounting related to the Fair Hydro Plan. They, along with the Office of the Provincial Controller, Mr. Speaker, ensured that this plan was in accordance Thank with you. the public sector, Mr. Ah, Speaker. Okay. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I know there's a lot of ice across Ontario this morning, but the minister sure skated around that question. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the auditor said KPMG told us that it has not provided an opinion on the accounting of the Fair Hydro Plan in the government's consolidated financial statements. On March 26, the minister said this, KPMG and Deloitte worked on the accounting related to the Fair Hydro Plan. They, along with the Office of the Provincial Controller, ensured that this plan was in accordance with public sector accounting. That was the quote from the Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, my question is, is he telling the truth? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. The truth is 25% of, of, of this population have seen a reduction of 25 percent, Mr. Speaker, on their hydro bills. The truth is that they voted against it, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to telling the truth, it's this government that makes sure that we're transparent and we make sure that we bring forward everything on behalf of the people. On that side of the House, Mr. Speaker, they vote against everything that we put forward to build Ontario up, Mr. Speaker. Minimum wage. We make sure that we bring that forward, Mr. Speaker, to help the province of Ontario. They vote against it, Mr. Speaker. 25% reduction through the Fair Hydro Plan, they vote against it, Mr. Speaker. 50% reduction on average for those families that are in Hydro One areas, Mr. Speaker, and six other jurisdictions, they voted against that as well, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to looking after the people of Ontario, we will take no lessons from that party, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General, an independent officer of the legislature, has said all of the accounting firms confirmed they didn't formally approve the Liberal accounting. Oh. But the minister says that they did. Deloitte, Ernst & Young and KPMG offered no formal opinion supporting the Fair Hydro Plan. And remember, this Liberal Unfair Hydro Plan spends millions and billions of dollars over the next 30 years in interest payments to get them through the next election period before rates soar to record highs, highs that we've never seen in Ontario. Speaker, what the minister has said in the House is a direct contradiction to many of the minister's statements. Why is he lying to the House? <laughs> The, uh, I'm standing. 
Not only will the member withdraw, if this becomes a trend, I will skip questions. The member will withdraw. Withdraw, Speaker. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the Fair Hydro Plan, it's this government that brought forward the plan to make sure that we reduce rates right across the province, Mr. Speaker, for all ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. On that side of the House, they voted against it. But the interesting thing, Mr. Speaker, is the People's Guarantee, which they once all signed and once all agreed with, actually kept the Fair Hydro Plan in it, Mr. Speaker. So talking about hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker, that is something that they show that's The member will withdraw. I will withdraw, Mr. Speaker. The member from Grenfell Nipissing Pembroke will withdraw, and the member from Grenfell Nipissing Pembroke is warned. And I'm skipping a question. You may finish. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work to keep our system clean, reliable, and affordable in this province, Mr. Speaker. We will make sure that we work together with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Answer. to make sure we're meeting our Climate Change Action Plan goals, Mr. Speaker, and keep our system clean and affordable. Thank you. We are now in warnings. The member from Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier or the one who will be replacing her. Does the Premier believe hospital overcrowding is a normal thing that should be happening in a first world healthcare system. From the, the acting Premier. Uh, Minister of Education on behalf of the Minister of Health. Minister of Education on behalf of the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite uh, for this question. Speaker, our government knows that everyone in Ontario deserves high-quality care when and where they need it. That's why we are designing a system that absolutely puts patients first. And I want you to know that we're doing this in a number of ways. We're doing this by increasing operational funding. We're doing this by increasing uh, capital funding. We're doing this by increasing the supports we are building into the system in terms of mental health, in terms of long-term care and in terms of across-the-board funding when it comes to uh, ensuring that our people and our patients uh, are getting the care they need. So let me just tell you, we've made a historic investment in terms of an additional $822 million in Ontario's publicly funded hospitals. This is a 4.6 percent increase in operational funding. We're also, of course, increasing what we're putting into uh, capital Answer. funding, $19 billion. Over the past two years, we've increased operational funding to hospitals by almost $1 billion. So absolutely, we'll building... Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, has the minister seen a hospital where people are being treated in hallways? Does she believe that it is real? Thank you, minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to point out a couple of things. So, you know, first of all, uh, I want to say that you know, ensuring that we are doing the best we can when we deliver health care is a top priority, and it turns out that we're on track. In fact, just recently, just last week, uh, once again, a third party has validated our health care system as being one of the best in the country. In fact, recently, CIHI, the Fraser Institute, the Wait Times Alliance have all agreed we are the best for wait times in Canada. And here's what we're doing. We're constantly investing to improve and make sure we're putting patients first. Wait times for cancer surgery are better than the national average for lung, breast, colorectal, and prostate cancers. Ontario has the best wait times in the country for lung cancer surgery. Our wait times are better than the national average Answer. for hip and knee replacement. And we outperform almost every other province for hip and knee replacement surgery. All this to say is that we're on track. Thank you. Final supplementary. Has the minister ever talked to any of the hundreds of people who have gone to a hospital only to be admitted and treated in a shower room, a TV room, a broom closet, or a bathroom? Thank you. Minister. 
So, Mr. Speaker, let me just talk a little bit about our capital investments. Uh, just so you are aware, we're investing $19 billion over the next 10 years to improve and expand hospitals. Just think about that. That is a massive investment in terms of hospitals and in terms of capital care. So we are actually ensuring that we're building hospitals, renovating them, and taking care of additions. In fact, let me just talk about where some of these capital investments investments are going. So, we're fortunate enough to have Sick Kids, one of the world's largest and most respected pediatric hospitals in the country and in the world. $2.4 billion for design and construction as part of that massive redevelopment. The new patient care centre will bring vital services, including emergency and critical care. And in fact, a facility at Health Sciences Answer. North for Northern Ontario, new health campus for W. Waha. All this to say is we're investing across the province and we're building Building that Thank infrastructure you. that is needed. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. When the Premier the reads the newspaper, hears New Democrat, listen to people who are telling her there is a crisis in her hospital, who does she think is responsible for that crisis? Mm -hmm. Acting Premier. Uh, Speaker, the Premier and this government is very much committed to investing in our, in our public uh, health care system. This is something that we've been doing, uh, 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 doing so uh, from, the, from the beginning, making sure that we, uh, we bring our wait times down in our, in our hospital to make sure that there is new capital investments being made all across the province so that there are better right. uh, facilities available in, in all communities across the province. I just see in my hometown of Ottawa, Speaker, and I, I see that every single hospital in Ottawa has go, uh, grown exponentially. We've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, a state-of-the-art regional cancer care center at the Ottawa Hospital on the general campus. We just built a new cardiac care unit at the Ottawa Heart Institute. We just announced, Speaker, $1.8 billion to build a new civic hospital in my community at the Ottawa Center. These are all important investments to, oh, to ensure that we provide quality care to Ontarians across this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Global Standard says that safe level of occupancy for a hospital is 85 percent, but all across our province, hospitals are running at over 100 percent capacity. Why does the minister think that hospitals are running at unsafe level of capacity and are overcrowded? Why, Speaker? Thank you. Speaker, just in this year's budget, which I hope the NDP will support, Speaker, we are investing more than an additional $5 billion over the next three years to provide more and better access to health care services. Our investment, Speaker, will also help reduce the time and stress associated with caring for our loved ones. This includes, Speaker, $2.1 billion in new funding for better and faster access to mental health and addiction services for hundreds of thousands more children, young people, and adults. Speaker, that is the single largest investment in mental health care and yes, addiction sir. services ever in the history of our province, which is part of Budget 2018. We are also, Speaker, expanding OHIP Plus to make prescriptions completely free for everyone up to the age of 25 and over 65. Once again, Speaker, we're the first province in the country to Answer. actually provide universal pharma care, something we hope the NDP will support. support. Not it. to mention we're introducing the new Ontario Drug and Dental Program Thank you. and reducing wait times to additional investment. Thank you. I'll supplement you. The Premier and the Liberals created this crisis in our hospital. And now what people want to know what's next. We know that with Doug Ford, he will cut and privatize. For health care, that means more hallway medicine. But today, my leader, Andrea Horvath, is announcing a plan to fix the crisis in our hospital. There's going to be hope, Speaker. We won't just stop the damage, we will fix it. We know that the Premier says she cares, but is she sorry she let things go so bad? 
Well, speaker, one thing, uh, one thing NDP and we agree is that Doug Ford will cut health care services. It's very clear from their $10 billion cuts that they have, uh, they have part of their platform that they're going to be firing teachers and nurses and personal support workers all across our province, and that's something yeah. that we will not stand for. But, Speaker, we have continued to make investments in our health care system all across the province, and NDP should come forward and support this very important budget that is investing over $5 billion over the next three years to provide a better access to health care services across the province, including services for mental health care uh, and addiction services. Speaker, just talking about reducing uh, wait times, we're uh, investing an additional $822 million in our Ontario hospitals. It's the largest single government investment in, in hospitals in almost a decade. Not to mention, Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, we invest billions of Answer. dollars uh, in, in, in new hospitals, expanding hospitals so that our Ontarians have state-of-the-art care you. available right in their community. New question. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Much, uh, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Finance. Experts are predicting the price of gas will jump to more than $1.40 per litre in Ontario this summer. Wow. This government has already said that their cap-and-trade carbon tax has pushed prices up by at least 4.3 cents per litre. Speaker, it's just another example of how every day the Liberals were making it more expensive to live and work in this province. There are millions of people in Ontario who can't get to work or run an errand without gas in their tank. Why is this Liberal government kicking these people when they're down? Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question because the member opposite makes reference to a commodity price that is traded globally. Yeah. And recognizing that uh, prices have been going up and the yeah. commodity price all around the world, it affects us. But, Mr. Speaker, he also references cap and trade, a market uh, that has been created with the Western Climate Initiative with Quebec, California, and, and we have Jerry Brown here this week. My signal not strong enough? We have the governor here in town talking about the merits because the state of California has been increasing their GDP and they've been growing, as has Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Furthermore, there is an alternative, and the alternative that the opposition is proposing is a carbon tax ultimately, which is going to cost taxpayers and the residents of yes, our sir. province more money taken out of their pockets in this budget. We provided measures for affordability. Thank they you. should be supporting us, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, back to the minister. When the price of gas jumps, it raises the price of almost everything that people buy. The terrible energy decisions made by this government have, forced, have already forced too many families to face a choice to heat or eat. Now, new fears are rising about being able to afford fuel to get to work, groceries to put on the table, and other basic necessities. The price of the Liberal cap-and-trade carbon tax is only making this situation worse. What does this Liberal government have to say to the thousands of people worried that her government's policies will once again force them to make heartbreaking decisions for their families? Mr. Environment, Mr. Speaker. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you for uh, for that question. You know, Speaker, it appears that the member opposite uh, and the members of the uh, PC party care about the regular folks of Ontario, but in fact, their opposition to fighting climate change, their opposition to our cap and trade clearly demonstrates they really don't care about folks here in Ontario. I can tell you, Speaker, their attack on climate change, their attack on our cap-and-trade process is an attack on the health of Ontarians. It is an attack on the member from Haldeman Norfolk is warned. And the member from Niagara West Glanbrook can hide his hand in front of his face all he wants. I still recognize the voice. I've been around. Right? Finish, please. 
Thank you, Speaker. Let me continue that the PC attack on climate change, the PC attack on our capital Answer. trade program is an attack on Ontario business, an attack on Ontario residents, and we won't Thank stand you. for that. New question. The member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. Premier, Acting Premier, in 2013, you promised the people of this province you see a 15 per cent reduction in their auto insurance rates. Here we are in 2018, and not only have we not seen that reduction, but last Friday we found out our insurance rates were actually going to go up yet again. Remember from Ancaster, Dundas, South, South, um, Westdale is warned. Finish, please. Thank you. That money that comes out of people's ability to pay for their food, pay for rising costs of gasoline, and pay for these out-of-control hydro rates. Premier, you admitted in this House that lowering auto insurance rates by 15 per cent was a stretch goal. Will you now admit it was a, never a goal at all and that you're unwilling to act as these rates continue to climb yet again? Question. Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Finance. Mr. Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite does make reference to the fact that rates have, and on auto insurance rates, have been challenging, and we have taken many steps to try to maintain and reduce. When you uh, when you rate it for inflation, rates have actually gone down on average by 11 percent. But more importantly, Mr. Speaker, all across Canada, rates have been going up, while in Ontario, they have not. What we must do, however, is continue to be diligent, and that's why we've taken the measures with the fraud office, measures to provide for additional programming to reduce those costs of claims to thereby reducing premiums over time. More importantly, there is some fraud that needs to be eliminated, Mr. Speaker. We're taking those steps. We're working hard to do so. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And anything you've done to correct auto insurance has hurt victims. Back to the acting premier. Last year, a report found that Ontario had the most expensive auto insurance premiums in Canada. And yet, compared to other provinces, Ontario is one of the lowest levels of collisions. We ask you to end postal code discrimination, and you won't do it. We ask you to lower auto insurance rates by 15 per cent, and you won't do it. When is enough going to be enough, and when are you going to seriously look at actually lowering people's auto insurance rates instead of watching them skyrocket? Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, as noted, we did take steps, numerous steps, and that is why in Ontario the rates have not been going up. But more importantly, our Ontario Fair Auto Insurance Plan, we have created independent medical examination centres. We provided improvement for victims uh, by creating a standard treatment plan for those minor injuries. We've established a serious fraud office, which is currently costing the system up to $1.6 billion in bogus claims. We're working with the Law Society for contingency on fee reforms. We've given fiscal greater teeth to conduct a postal code review so that we can be certain that we are not then penalizing rural communities and northern communities that don't have this instance. So we have to be mindful of that as well. And FISRA, the new oversight body of auto insurance and the regulatory power, has provided for increasing innovation and consumer protection mechanisms. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we've created that expert panel to provide proper guidance throughout this process. Thank you. New question. The member from Northumberland, Quinty West. <clears throat> well, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour. Minister, over the past number of years, I've spoken with countless families about the nature of their work as how the nature of their work has changed. These families are working hard to put food on their table and take care of the children, but they were finding that the money, that the money runs out before the month is over. While this supposition may not be shared by those across the aisle, I firmly believe that everyone who works 35 or 40 hours a week should have to, shouldn't have to struggle to get by. That is why I'm so pleased our government has made substantial changes to our workplace laws. This includes, of course, the increase to a $14 an hour minimum wage. Minister, can you please inform this House about how these changes came about and what employees can ex expect as a result? Good question. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. The conversations that the member outlines that he's had in his community echo what we've all heard across this province over the past three years, Speaker. When we embarked on that very extensive and comprehensive review of our employment laws, 
We knew that things had changed um, in the province of Ontario since we'd looked at them last. What we heard loud and clear from the people of Ontario was it was time to make some changes. That's why we moved forward with our plan to create the Fair Workplaces and the Better Jobs Act. We made the following changes, Speaker. Increased minimum wage, two paid personal emergency leave days, increased vacation, Speaker, equal pay for work of equal value, domestic and sexual violence leave, Speaker. Speaker, we didn't have support from everybody in the Answer. House which is disappointing but not so, uh, surprising, but I'm very proud of the work we've done to increase a lot of ordinary people in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Minister. We know our economy is doing well. It has led the G7 economic growth for over three years now. Since the recession, we have created over 820,000 jo new jobs, and our employment rate is the lowest point since 2001. Our business is expanding, creating wealth, and I believe that everyone deserves to share in that prosperity. And yet, these are those who, and yet there are those who believe it is still not time for these changes. They believe it's too soon. They believe $15 an hour is too much. They believe the working people of this province should wait, although they won't say for how long. I know that families in Northumberland Quinty West simply cannot wait. Those who are earning minimum wage deserve a wage that helps them make ends meet and save and save to go to go ahead. Question. Minister, in your plan, can Ontario expect fifteen dollar minimum wage? Is that subject to change? Thank you. Minister Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you again for the supplementary speaker. It's very, very simple. We're going to be increasing the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour as of January first, twenty nineteen, Speaker. Speaker, we know the we know the party across the, uh, across the aisle plans to cancel the increase to $15 to take money away from minimum wage earners. That's money they rely on for food, Speaker, for rent, for transit, for living expenses. We on this side of the House don't think that's fair, Speaker. We don't think it's right. We don't think Ontarians should have to wait any longer. We phased the minimum wage in over 18 months. It's going to be tied back to inflation after the January 2019 increase. What it means is uh, it ensures that more workers are benefiting from Ontario's economic growth, Speaker. You add that to free tuition, to rent control, to OHIP Plus, it's just another step towards increasing fairness, Answer. creating more opportunity, Speaker. Speaker, we're standing up for workers. We have their backs. Thank you. The PCs should come along with us. New question. The member from Scarborough, News River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the acting premier. The headline in this morning's Toronto Sun reads, quotation, biggest fraud in auto insurance is a liberal promise to lower rates, quotation, close. Acting premier, under the liberal government watch, the auto insurance rates have increased 29%, much higher than the inflation rate. Yet, Ontarians already pay 55% higher than the Canadian average and remain the highest car insurance rate in Canada while having one of the lowest claims. Despite your previous promise, why the people of Ontario paying the highest insurance rate in Canada under your leadership? Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me correct the record there. The member opposite makes reference to the inflation adjusted term of auto insurance rate. He's absolutely wrong. If he takes that effect, if he takes that measure, rates have gone down on average by 11 percent. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the acting premier again. Provincial election is just around the corner. What kind of election promise you are going to make to fool the people of Ontario this time? Uh, let me see if I get this right. The member opposite has referenced the fact that auto insurance rates have gone up, but they've actually have gone down. And then he says that what action should we take? Move. Last test. I won't fail. Then he makes reference to the steps 
that are being taken, but then he says they're not, which in fact they are, like the fraud office, like the work we're doing with uh, uh, programs to reduce the overall cost of, uh, of the auto insurance, which is in fact too high in Ontario. We acknowledge that. So that's why we've taken the steps that we have to eliminate them, yeah. to eliminate some of the fraud. Mr. Speaker, they vote against those very measures that are helping Ontarians. Okay. So we will continue to do what's necessary to establish that fraud office, Answer. to ensure that the minor claims are immediately attended to, and ensure that we get rid of the fat that's in the system that's taken abuse. We need to reduce that. Mr. Thank Speaker, you. they should support us on that issue. No question. The member from London West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, I'd like to refer the Acting Premier to a document from London Health Sciences Centre called the Hallway Transfer Protocol that was approved on January 31st. The protocol sets out the rules for the transfer of patients from the emergency department to the hallway, from critical care to the hallway, and from the post-anesthetic care unit to the hallway. The rules include stairwells are not to be used. Stretchers are to be lined up on just one side of the hallway. Patients should be regularly assessed for sleep deprivation in order to prevent incidents of violence. No Speaker, will the Acting Premier accept responsibility for his government's chronic underfunding of our health care system that has allowed hallway medicine to become normalized at London Health Sciences Centre? Thank you. Acting Premier. Speaker, Minister of Education, on behalf of Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Education, on behalf of Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member opposite for that very important question. Speaker, we recognize that our growing and aging population is facing increasing pressures and, and that we need to ensure that we are building a solid health care system. And so, Speaker, I want to talk about some of the things that we are doing. In fact, in our budget, we are making deliberate choices to invest in care for the people of Ontario by investing not just in one place and in one sector, but across the board. We we're investing in hospitals, we're investing in home care, we're investing in mental health, and we're investing in long-term care. Why? Because we recognize that we are investing in the people of Ontario because it means a better quality of life. But you know what, Speaker? I want to talk a little bit about what happened under the NDP's watch. Let's just talk a little bit about their track record. After all, the NDP's plan will cut 9,645 hospital beds like they did in the past. Is that what's going to happen? Is that what's going to happen with your new plan, Thank you. our plan. Supplementary. <laughs> Again to the acting premier. Speaker, last Thursday, the London and District Academy of Medicine held a patient care forum for Londoners to share their experiences with our health care system. In 2014, David Cameron Texera waited four days in a, uh, in a London Health Sciences Centre hallway. Earlier this month, Don Warren waited five days in a London Health Sciences Centre hallway. Speaker, hallway medicine has been a reality in London for years, and this Liberal government has done nothing to fix it. Does the acting premier think that a hallway transfer protocol at LHSC is an acceptable solution to the years of budget cuts that have led to people lining the hallways of London Health Sciences Centre on a regular, ongoing basis? You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Again, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about the investments that we're making. So, absolutely, we are doing everything we can to ensure that we're building a solid health care system. $822 million in operating funds. That's a 4.6% overall increase to increase capacity, decrease wait times, and improve access to care for families. This funding is definitely going to uh, benefit the people of Ontario, whether it translates into 26000 additional MRI operating hours, 14,000 more surgical and medical procedures, 3,000 more cardiac procedures. In addition to all of this, $19 billion in capital grants to ensure our world-class hospitals will be there to support our province in the future, including $2.4 billion, as I mentioned, for sick kids, $1.9 billion Answer. over three years to make life more affordable for millions of Ontarians through prescription drugs, OHIP Plus, and Ontario Drug and Dental Programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Trinity Spadina. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister responsible for Poverty Reduction Strategy. Speaker, on this side of the House, we recognize that empowering individuals and families to reach their full potential is the right thing to do. Absolutely. We know that a fair Ontario is one that builds every one of us up, no matter who you are, where you were born. That's why our government chooses care and progress instead of cuts. We also know that there is more work to be done in this area. Speaker, last week, the minister released the Poverty Reduction Strategy Annual Report for 2017. The, this annual report details province progress on a target like the reduction of child poverty and the reduction of depths of poverty on, on, in Ontario. Could the minister highlight the progress shown on this year's annual report? Here, here. Minister responsible for housing, uh, Minister of Housing and responsible for poverty reduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for Trinity Spadina for the question. Mr. Speaker, I'm so proud to say that Ontarians are really seeing the results of our poverty reduction initiatives. The number of children living in poverty has decreased by 19,000. That's a decrease of 24.2 per cent from 2012. We've made investments in full-day kindergarten for 260,000 four- and five-year-olds. The Ontario Child Benefit is being delivered directly to individuals and families to, with low and moderate incomes. The OHIP Plus Pharmacare program is providing free prescriptions to Ontarians 24 and under. And we're raising the minimum wage to $15 to make sure that working Ontarians can make ends meet. We know our economy is strong. Not everyone is benefiting from that, but we're doing everything we can to lift Ontarians out of poverty, provide them with more opportunity, Answer. more care, and more fairness, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. I would like to thank the minister for the answer. I'm happy to say that my constituents are feeding the benefits of this government's investment in them. Through the local poverty reduction fund, the province has funded the Scatting Court Community Centre in my riding of Trinity Spadina. The Scatting Court Community Centre offers programming targeting, targeted to underserviced and culturally diverse groups, bringing 500 to 600 visitors daily. We also know that there is more to be done. It, it has become clear to my constituents and all those living in Ontario that coming June 7th, a stark choice is to be made. Speaker. How will my constituents to know what, what stands to be lost given the $9.6 billion fiscal, fiscal hole resulting from the PC's decision to walk away from the cap-and-trade program? Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Speaker, I spent four years on Toronto Council with Doug Ford, Ooh. and while his brother had the common touch, to Doug Ford is out of touch. Whether it's $9.6 billion fiscal hole, does he understand what that means? While he was spinning Ferris wheels and shopping malls on City Council, he had no idea about the services that Torontonians depended on from government, and he has no idea what Ontarians depend on. Just one billion of the cuts that he would uh, put in place would roll back all of our uh, housing initiatives in this province. It means cutting our programs to help those who are homeless. It means taking away the basic income pilot. It means cutting real dollars away from our social housing retrofit. The person who claims that he cares about the little people and the ones in social Answer. housing, he's going to cut the money that's going to fix their homes. Right. Doug Ford is out of touch, Mr. Thank you. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Order. No question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, does the Premier believe that a $6 million salary is acceptable for the CEO of Hydro One? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, we talked about this last week, but at first I'd like to start off with the weather that we've had over the last couple of days. I want to thank all of the Hydro One workers. The uh, utilities right across the province for making sure that they get us back and connected so we can have power right across the province. Doug 
As well, Mr. Speaker, moving forward, we recognize that salaries, um, Mr. Speaker, are, are hard to imagine for many families right across uh, across the province, Mr. Speaker. But we make sure that uh, you know the board will continue to monitor this, and Mr. Speaker, they need to ensure that uh, you know they they are bringing forward savings for the ratepayers. Last year, the executive yes, at uh, at Hydro One were able to find 114 million dollars in savings that led to lower bills for customers, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, uh, back to the Premier. It's actually shocking to see the Liberals defend the $6 million man and the salary of the CEO at Hydro One when people across the province are struggling to pay their electricity bills. They're having to choose between heating and eating. Under the Liberals, we've seen the cost of electricity rise by 300 per cent, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Does she believe that a $6 million salary is acceptable for the CEO at Hydro One? The Minister of Advanced Education is warned. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, do the people of Ontario find it acceptable, but that party votes against giving them a 25 per cent savings, Mr. Speaker? Do the people of Ontario find it acceptable that that party votes against anything to do with climate change, Mr. Speaker? On this side of the House, we make sure that we continue to act in the best interest of the people of Ontario. The Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, will do nothing, nothing to lower electricity bills for Ontario families. By talking about firing the CEO of Hydro One, that doesn't take anything off of anybody's bills, Mr. Speaker. And let's, you know, let's see what the well-respected business journalists that are talking about Mr. Ford's reckless plan, Mr. Speaker. He said the Ontario Progressive Conservatives have been obsessed with the broadening of ownership, spreading misinformation about this company, Mr. Speaker. He also pointed out that the opposition parties. Excuse me. Withdraw. My apologies, Mr. Speaker. I do withdraw. That's all you have to say. Just withdraw. Thank you. Thank you. He also pointed out that the opposition party seemed to forget or leave out every single time. Hydro One doesn't set the rates, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. It must get approval for any rate changes from the Ontario Energy Board okay. and which factors and issues such as employee compensation when making its decisions. Thank, thank you very much. New question. The member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. For almost two years, my constituent Norm Fowler and his 92-year-old wife, low-income seniors, have been fighting with Hydro One to get full compensation after Hydro Crews accidentally blew up their appliances at their rent geared to income residents in Thorold. That's right, Speaker. 220 volts went through their building at 61 Ormond Street in Thorold instead of the intended 110 volts, destroying the appliances, and Hydro One is refusing to pay the full compensation of $1,100 to them. Speaker, Ontario Democrats have been warning about privatization of hydro, and here we are cutting corners, and seniors are left in our community to bear the brunt. Why is the li Liberal government allowing vulnerable, low-income seniors in our communities to pay the expensive price for this government's short-sighted decisions? Question. Thank you. Mr. Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank the member for the question, and I can say that um, there are other customers from this complex that are coming forward as well, Mr. Speaker, and submitting claims. Um, and Hydro One will will be reviewing every single one of those claims and assessing them on their individual merits, Mr. Speaker. And I understand that Hydro One is working hard to resolve uh, this matter, Mr. Speaker. Two supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's been two years that these seniors, low-income seniors, have been waiting for their restitution. This error was made at the hands of Hydro One at a residence in my riding that houses low-income tenants, most of them seniors. They now have been forced to pay $1,100 to replace their own appliances. Meanwhile, under the Liberal government's watch, Hydro One executives received $11 million in compensation last year. Again, I ask the Premier, why does the Liberal government continue to allow vulnerable seniors in my riding to bear the brunt for short-sighted and ill-informed decisions? 
Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, as I said earlier, I understand that Hydro One is actively looking into this customer's concerns as we speak, Mr. Speaker. They're also working with the uh, the complex where there are other claims being submitted, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know that said, since the broad broadening of the ownership of Hydro One, um, it has become a better run company under new management. Hydro One is improving on a number of service uh, metrics, Mr. Speaker. First one, Hydro One has indicated it has improved the quality of their call center interactions through improved training for staff and performance management. Additionally, since the broadening of ownership, management has found $114 million in savings, which helped keep ratepayers' bills low, Mr. Speaker. And I know the biggest idea that the uh, NDP has when it comes to energy is to buy back shares of Hydro One will again do nothing to Answer. reduce bills, Mr. Speaker. Hydro rates continue to be regulated by the Ontario Energy Board, who have the mandate to protect ratepayers, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question this morning is to the Attorney General. Access to justice is a key issue that many people across Ontario face daily. And I know that our government has made record investments into improving access to justice, but there is always more that can be done, specifically for our most vulnerable. These people are often low income and often marginalized and racialized. They need more. They need our support the most because, as we know, the justice system can often be a lengthy and costly process. I, I can guarantee that all of the members in this House have heard stories about how constituents, in going through their cases or trials, cannot afford a lawyer. They then turn to legal aid. In my own riding of Davenport, the West Toronto Legal Clinic and Legal Aid Ontario overall has been instrumental in supporting those who most need the support, but they need more help. Can the Attorney General please detail how our government intends to bolster legal aid? Question. Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member from Davenport for, for the question. Speaker, we know how important uh, access to justice in Ontario is. That is why Ontario is providing more people with affordable access to legal services by increasing the financial eligibility threshold for legal aid by another 6%. As of April the 1st, uh, Speaker, this year about 140,000 more people are now eligible to receive the legal services they need reg regardless of their ability to pay. This is because of uh, provinces investments in Legal Aid Ontario, also known as LAO, to increase access to legal aid services for low-income and vulnerable people province-wide. This is part of Speaker Ontario's 2014 commitment to expand access to legal aid services provided by LAO to an additional 1 million Ontarians Answer. in 10 years. With more than 500,000 additional people who will be eligible for legal aid, Ontario is now more than halfway to this very important goal. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would like to thank the Attorney General for his answer. That is excellent news, and I'm sure that this funding will be a lot of help in not only my riding at Davenport, but across the province in every member's riding. Here, here. Despite this major investment, I have heard that there are certain communities or groups who have unique needs and whose services need to be tailored towards them. For instance, in my riding of Davenport, in fact, across Toronto, there is a large LGBTQ2 community, many of whom have very specific needs. Needs. This community has a significantly higher rate of sexual and domestic or intimate partner violence and very low rates of reporting. As many of us have heard, they, have also, they also have a strained relationship with the justice system. Can the Attorney General please explain how we are going to invest in supporting the LGBTQ2 community? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And, and the member from Devonport asked a very important question. Speaker, as I have uh, stated, supporting our most vulnerable is a major priority for our government. In our recently announced gender-based violence strategy, we announced a $242 million investment that commits our province to providing further supports for survivors and those who are at risk of gender-based violence. We also announced a new pilot speaker. Um, our government is piloting Canada's first ever LGBTQ2 community legal clinic right here in Toronto. Speaker, this clinic will be, made, will be made to meet the need for specialized legal support within this community and work to address the high rate of sexual assault and hopefully encourage people to step forward and improve reporting of yes, abuse. Speaker, because of our government um, understanding, these sort of investments are crucial to building an inclusive and supportive Thank province. You. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the last two weeks, how much money 
has the Liberals spent campaigning on the taxpayers' dime? Good question. That's a very good question. Mr. Speaker, you know, I understand why the, uh, the member opposite would not want us to talk about the budget plan that we uh, brought in, Mr. Speaker. I understand that they don't want to talk about uh, child care, Mr. Speaker. They don't want to talk about investment in home care or long-term care, Mr. Speaker. They don't want to acknowledge that right now people in this province, even though our economy is growing, even though our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 20 years, that not everybody's feeling the benefit of that, Mr. Speaker. And so we need to step up as a government and provide the care and the tools that people need to be able to care for themselves and care for their families. I understand why the, this party would not want to talk about that, Mr. Speaker, because they have no idea and no plan for how they would meet those needs, how they would help people to care for themselves, Mr. Speaker. And so I get why they don't want us talking about our budget, as we do every year, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Supplementary. Back talk, to the Premier. The happen. Liberals have held no fewer than 25 campaign-style events over the last two weeks. Wow. This comes at an busy, incredible busy. expense to the taxpayer. Yeah. Speaker, will the Liberal Party pay back the taxpayer for their campaign-style events? Put the money in their pocket. Okay. What we have been saying as we have been uh, talking to the people of Ontario since we brought the budget in, Mr. Speaker, as we do every year, we talk about what is in our budget so people will know what it is we're debating in the legislature, Mr. Speaker, and what they can expect. As we, uh, as we implement the budget should it pass in the legislature, Mr. Speaker. So we're talking about investing more in seniors' care, Mr. Speaker, and in fact giving, giving caregivers some support when they're looking after an, an older, uh, loved relative, Mr. Speaker, giving them some money to actually be able to keep up the house, Mr. Speaker. We are talking about providing child care, uh, free preschool child care, Mr. Speaker, for two and a half to four year olds. One of the interesting things that the leader Answer. of the opposition talked about was that was a ridiculous policy because it was for unborn children. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> government exists to yeah, put in place the conditions for all children. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Oshawa. We just updated Ontario's employment standards, and then you and your government secretly threw in an exemption to limit the personal emergency leave and bereavement days of auto workers. You specifically set your sights on auto workers. This isn't right, and it isn't fair. The minister has said that this exemption will help to keep Ontario competitive in the global market. Speaker, Ontario should not be competing in a race to the bottom. We should be setting the standard when it comes to workers' rights. Why does the Premier think it is okay to give auto workers fewer leave days than everybody else? Thank you. Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Uh, Speaker, on January the 1st of, 12, uh, of uh, 2017, after we'd had a consultation with the industry, with stakeholders, and with others involved in the auto industry, Speaker, we put in place a personal emergency leave pilot project in the auto sector. What it required is that auto sector's employers with more than 50 employees provide each employee use of up to seven personal emergency leave days, as well as up to uh, three days for the unfortunate death of a family member should that occur, Speaker. Speaker, it was a very specific recommendation of the special advisors of the Changing Workplaces Review. Now, as a result of that, Speaker, of the actions we took on Bill 148, as of January the 1st of 2018, the 50 employee threshold was removed, and for the first time ever, Speaker, all employers in the auto sector are required to make Answer. personal emergency leave available to each employee, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Premier. You put a specific target on auto workers. However, in my community of Oshawa, cleaners in the GM plants are finding they are being redesignated to auto workers, so their leave days can be limited too. When this House was reviewing Ontario's employment standards, both the Liberals and the Conservatives voted against the NDP amendment that would have ensured that everybody had access to the same leave days guaranteed in the new Employment Standards Act. Now we can see why you voted against the fix. This government now can unfairly target any workers in the whole auto industry. 
I know the minister has been meeting with Unifor on this issue, and I know auto workers in our communities want to know, will you commit today to amending the Employment Standards Act to ensure that all workers get the same access to leave days? Thank you. Minister. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for that supplementary speaker. Speaker, with the auto strategy we have in the province of Ontario, we're committed to the success of this province's auto sector. It's a very highly competitive global economy, and we're going to make sure that that success, Speaker, is shared with the employees that work in the sector. As the labour reforms work out, Speaker, we continue to engage with stakeholders. This is a pilot project, Speaker, that was put in place. In some ways, it improved, Speaker. In some ways, it, it had a neutralizing effect on personal emergency leave. Last week, Speaker, I was able to sit down with Unifor, with a number of people that work in the uh, domestic market, Speaker, Good with idea. those that work at Toyota, at Honda, Speaker. Good. We're working towards a resolution of this issue, Excellent. Speaker. We said we would do an evaluation of the pilot project. We're keeping Answer. our word. That's exactly what we're doing, Speaker. Good question. The member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is a top priority for our government, and it's important to recognize that reconciliation is not just an event or an apology. It's a journey that we have committed to taking together with our Indigenous partners. And, Speaker, in Beaches East York, I am so proud to go to my local schools and, during the morning announcements, hear the acknowledgement we make to Indigenous people, because I know the next generation is growing up better understanding their responsibilities to work together. So, Speaker, I understand that last week the minister was joined by Indigenous partners and former ministers to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the creation of his ministry. Speaker, will the minister please tell us more about this event and the work that the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation has been doing in his tenure and what the ministry over the last 10 years Question. has been doing together with our Indigenous Thank partners? Thank you, Speaker. Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Speaker, the story of the Ministry of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation begins with the tragic Aperwash uh, Provincial Park uh, actions. But for eight years following that, the uh, then Harris government ignored calls for Indigenous peoples for an inquiry into the Aperwash crisis. But within a month of taking office in 2003, then Attorney General Michael Bryant commissioned an inquiry. The inquiry report recommended, among other things, that the Ministry of Indigenous Relations be established. Last week, I was joined by Indigenous partners and former ministers and civil servants and other stakeholders to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this ministry. The ministry closes gaps and removes barriers. It supports cultural revitalization. It's a meaningful yes, source of resolutions to the historic grievances of Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for not just his answer, Speaker, but for the stalwart work that he puts into his ministry and building bridges with our Indigenous partners. In the story of the ministry's creation, I hear, that a, I hear of a government that listens, that cares, and that takes action. Realizing a positive social change can take a long time, and we've seen a great deal of good come from the work that this ministry has done across government over the past 10 years. In fact, in just the past four years, I've seen our government officially apologize for Ontario's role in the residential school system and make a historic $250 million commitment to reconciliation through the journey together. We've also committed $108 million to take actions to end violence against Indigenous women. And we passed the Treaty Recognition Week Act, making Ontario the first province to officially celebrate this week in November. Finally, Speaker, we've made Indigenous history and culture a mandatory part of Ontario's curriculum and Ontario's culture. Can the minister tell us more about these incredible steps that we are taking together with our Indigenous partners moving towards reconciliation? Minister. Speaker, last week we heard from Indigenous partners who joined us for this celebration just how significant the work of the ministry was. As we mark the first decade of this new ministry devoted to Indigenous issues, it is important to look back and take stock and rededicate ourselves. But, Speaker, I am worried. I am worried that this ministry is at risk 
if the Conservative government is elected next yeah, fall. Speaker, we've seen time and time again that Indigenous issues are at the bottom of the Progressive Conservative agenda. Yes, they, they voted against our $250 million commitment to reconciliation twice, not to mention our $1 billion commitment to the Ring of Fire infrastructure. <laughs> Speaker, reconciliation is more than words. Yes, it's action. It's commitments. This government has shown that the official opposition Thank has you. not and will not. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. New question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex. Elgin. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, surgery wait times in Ontario have reached catastrophic levels. Last week, uh, Ottawa resident Ruth McKenzie witnessed firsthand your government's health care failures when her surgery was cancelled moments before going under the knife. My question for the Premier is, does she think it's acceptable to cancel surgeries moments before scheduled uh, surgeries to take place? Good question. Mr. Speaker, I don't know the specifics of that situation, and I'm sure that the, uh, the member opposite will uh, share it with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. But, Mr. Speaker, again, I, I hope that this concern that the member opposite is expressing will encourage him to vote for the budget, Mr. Speaker, in which we have included a significant investment, $822 million, Mr. Speaker, to hospitals, including, Mr. Speaker, more funding for home care, more funding for mental health care, Mr. Speaker. I hope that this member sees that it is, uh, it is imperative that we continue to invest in our health care system. Every year, Mr. Speaker, we have included and increased funding to our hospitals, to home care, to health care across the province, Mr. Speaker. But we recognize, we recognize that there is more that we need to do, so I hope the member opposite yes, will be supporting us as we bring forward our budgetary changes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, it's interesting the Premier answers that question as such, considering it was her government to froze hospital funding for five years. It's yeah, her government painful. that attacked our doctors. It's her government that built the infrastructure of bureaucracy, reducing the funds, reaching our patients in the front lines. Mr. Speaker, this government has been a failure in managing health care and is only promising the world as a last-minute game in order to gain votes. Mr. Speaker. This is the second time the surgery for Mrs. McKenzie has been cancelled because of this government's failures. Last month, it was cancelled because of overcrowding in the hospital because the government failed in supporting the hospitals during the flu season. Two cancelled surgeries in one month, but it's becoming the norm in this province. Last month, a London patient had to have their bypass surgery cancelled at the last moment for the fourth time. It's unacceptable the level of care this government is providing the people of Ontario. Will the minister call the Ottawa Hospital and ask that that surgery be scheduled ASAP? Well, again, Mr. Speaker, I don't know the specifics of the individual case that the member opposite is raising, but I know that he will share that information with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. But it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, what, uh, what the member opposite said about the budgets from year to year, Mr. Speaker, we have increased funding every year to hospitals and across the health care system, Mr. Speaker. And it's interesting that an organization like the Fraser Institute, Mr. Speaker, which I think the member opposite can agree is not exactly an, an organization that is friendly to our government, but the Fraser Institute has joined with Kai Hai, Mr. Speaker, the Wait Times Alliance. They have all agreed that Ontario is at the very top, the best for wait times in this country, Mr. Speaker. So, that is the reality, that's the truth of the situation, that we are leading the country in terms of wait times, Mr. Speaker. But even with that, we recognize that there is more that we can do. And again, I call on the member opposite to support the budget because in that budget is a significant increase in funding, specifically to hospitals as well as to Thank mental you. health and to home care, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Today in the Speaker's Gallery, we have some very special guests. The Honourable Edmund G. Jerry Brown, Jr., the Governor of California. He's He's also accompanied by Juan Alassi, the Consul General of the United States.
Also, uh, also, also the former MPP for the riding of Nipissing during the 34th and 39th parliaments and currently Ontario's representative in Washington, Ms. Monique Smith. And one more time, my wife, Rosemarie. <laughs> point of order, point of order, the Premier. Point of order, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to add my welcome to yours to uh, Governor Brown and to thank him this morning at Mars. We had a terrific session on climate change, on the, uh, the cap and trade system, because our markets are linked, California, Ontario, Quebec. And we are reducing pollution in our three jurisdictions Thank and moving you. ahead and leading the world, Mr. Speaker. The member from uh, Etobicoke Centre on a point of order. Cap and trade, Doug Ford. We welcome two leaders of the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance who joined us partway through question period. Uh, we have with us uh, Stephanie Bellotto, who is the VP University Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier, Laurier University and a member of USA Steering Committee, and Landon Talk, who is USA's VP Finance. Welcome to Queen's Park. We have a deferred vote on the motion to second reading of Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community Safety and Correctional Services Act 2018. Correctional Services and uh, Reintegration Act 2018 to make related amendments to other acts, repeal an act, and to revoke regulations. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bell.
all members, please take your seats. Yep. You're good. On March 27, 2018, Madame Lalonde moved second reading of Bill 6, an act to enact the Ministry of Community and Safety of Correctional Services Act 2018 and the Correctional Services and Re Reintegration Act 2018 to make related amendments to other acts to repeal and act and to revoke regulations. All those in favour, please arise. One at a time be recognized by the clerk. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Mr. Susan. Mr. Susan. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. Sandal. Mr. Sandal. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Meridi. Mr. Meridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leo. Mr. Leo. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bernardinetti. Mr. Bernardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Domino. Mr. Domino. Mr. Bernio. Mr. Bernio. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Madame De Rosier. Madame De Rosier. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Schumanta. Ms. Schumanta. Ms. Sack. Ms. Sack. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. You're recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Yurick. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. The ayes are 55, the nays are 18. The ayes being 55, the nays being 18, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, Pursuant to the order of the House dated April 12, 2018, the bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.